Hello and welcome to The Daily Space for today, March 22nd, 2019. I am your host, Dr. Pamela Gay, and I am here to put science in your brains. Today we have a whole variety of different science and astronomy stories, and our top story starts with a question that is a new take on if a tree falls in the woods, does it still make a sound? In this case, the question is, if an asteroid blows up over the ocean, does anybody notice? And it turns out that today in our world of satellites imaging everything pretty much all the time, uh, seismometers, air pressure indicators, and all the other indicators and sensors we have out there, the answer is yes. The robots notice. Thank you, robot overlords. Back on December 18th of just 2018, at 1150 GMT, a giant space rock fell through our atmosphere and blew up over the Bering Strait. This particular explosion I promise you there's a little tiny explosion in the center of this giant weather photo. This particular explosion was a meteor, meteor that was 10 meters in diameter, 14 tons in mass, and it impacted with an energy of 173 kilotons of TNT. That's 10 times the uh, explosive power of the atomic bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima back in 1945. This is a whole lot of explosion going on. And it was noticed thanks to all the sensors out of out there. Now, what is so amazing about this is it brings to light that Earth is probably getting hit by stuff on a regular basis and has been through the ages. And it's only today with all of our sensor data that we're really able to keep track of everything that is hitting our world. As far as we've measured, this is the third most massive impact the Earth has had since we started keeping track of these things. Um, the most massive was the Tunguska event that occurred over Siberia back in the early 1900s. That particular event um, leveled 8 million trees and about 2,000 square kilometers of forest. The next most massive that we know of event was the Chelyabinsk meteor, meteorite strike that occurred back on Valentine's Day 2014, where we had um, a whole lot of windows get broken by a sonic boom, not a whole lot of damage from the actual meteorite strike. So it appears that at least these big things tend to explode in the atmosphere, which is far better than hitting the planet and causing a tsunami, causing a crater. Um, so yeah, our world is under attack by the universe, but it appears to not be that entirely dangerous of an attack. And it's kind of awesome that this was found, even if it was found after the fact, no dashboard cams required this time. So moving on to other news. In this case, we have news involving an extremely old star cluster. Now, it has long been believed, taught, assumed that the oldest star clusters in our Milky Way galaxy are the globular clusters out in the outskirts that orbit around our main disk galaxy. And these globular clusters I uh, just don't get harassed that much in ways that would disrupt them. It was generally assumed that any clusters that might have helped form the main disk that would have helped form the galactic bulge would have long ago been disrupted, would have long ago fallen apart. But Gemini, the telescope, is here to prove us slightly wrong. 
In this series of images taken with ever increasing detail by better and better telescopes, astronomers have been able to image a uh, rather boringly named cluster called HP1. And HP1 is more than 12 billion years old. It is one of the original building blocks of our galactic bulge, and it's still hanging out there going, hey, I'm here, and I'm really red, and I'm still a cluster of stars. And in this particular case, red stars mean a really old star cluster where it's only stars that have evolved to become red and the red dwarfs that were born red that still exist in this particular cluster. This system is about 6,000 light years away from the galactic center. And um, it's just cool to get to see something like this and know this is what our galaxy was made of. I'm, I'm sure more scientific results are going to be coming. But for now, the headline is that the Gemini telescope makes even the oldest star clusters look fabulous. Um, and sometimes that's all you need. Now I'm going to let you see, this is a context shot of that field. So here is our little tiny cluster. You can see it right about there. Let's see how close I can get before my finger. Nope. Can't get any closer. Um, so you can see it, uh, just this little tiny cluster off in the distance. Um, okay, and we have one final amazing pretty picture story for the day. Today really is a day of pretty pictures. I think everyone's just running a little bit exhausted from all the planetary science that came out of the Planetary Science Institute. Now, in this case, here I'm showing you an amazing visualization of data that has been collected over a long period of time by the Chandra X-ray Observatory. And this data has all been pieced together and now offers you over on YouTube an amazing video experience. And I'm hoping the sound will come through. And if it does, we're just going to take a minute to explore this unusual movie of our Milky Way. And this is an experience that is available for all of you. And it's recommended that you watch it in VR. So I will drop a link to this YouTube into the chat, as well as a link to the press release so that you can all go find this visualization to explore for yourselves. Now, uh, I'm kind of glad we're not yet to the point that Twitch is produced in VR because I think that's a little bit more production than I'm up to doing most days of the week but I'm glad there's other people out there allowing us to dive into these kinds of experiences. Now, this isn't so much uh, news that has happened, but news that could happen. I have one final um, thing you should keep an eye on kind of a story for you. This is our son is currently locked and loaded with a potential corona mass ejection pointed at the earth. Um, 
we have the way it's described here is a big crackling sunspot and we have a geomagnetic storm warning. Now here they're saying that uh, there may be auroras observable as far south as New York and Idaho. Uh, this means that England, Northern Europe, all of you, we're good. You're probably going to see something shiny and bright. Uh, so keep an eye out. And if you don't already pay attention to spaceweather.com, add it to your daily list. Continue, consider getting their notifications. Um, our sun's kind of active right now, and it's amazing to get to watch Aurora. Just being able to see them is one of those cool kinds of, hey, that that is unexpected, unscripted. We never know what they're going to look like. We never know what colors are going to be visible because it's the kind of thing that, well, chaos theory plays a role in what we get to experience. So consider going out and looking up this weekend or particularly tonight if your skies are clear. I'm a little too far south to get to enjoy it, but for those of you who are either way further south uh, down in the southern hemisphere or are more northern than I am, here's your chance to go see something awesome. So that is all the news I have for today. Uh, I am going to once again remind all of you that you are invited to join me on an astro tour uh, out to, sorry, I'm typing in the URL. You are all invited to join me out at Joshua Tree Park, along with other faces you may know from around Twitch. We are going to be going there and um, sharing the stars. And if going to Joshua Tree Park in June isn't your thing, there is a second tour available to you. Oh man, I totally can't type today. Um, that you could go with me and that's misspelled. So the URL is astrotours.co slash starstrider. And this is your chance to travel through my favorite part of the United States and see amazing landscapes, dark skies, and some of the observational astronomy facilities where I learned how to observe. So come with me and let's explore the sky together. So that is all of our news for today. You are now all encouraged to type in your questions and just please remember to at me when you do so. Now, uh, if you ever miss an episode, you can always catch up over on either our YouTube channel. And if you're over on YouTube and you have some questions, come join us over on Twitch. We are here most Mondays through Fridays at 1 p.m. Eastern. That's 10 a.m. Pacific. And right now, due to different people switching to daylight savings time at different times, that is 5 p.m. London time. We are a production of the Planetary Science Institute working in collaboration with Youngstown State University. We are here as part of a 501c3 nonprofit dedicated to exploring our solar system. We are sustained by the generous donations of people like you. Every bit, every sub, every donation helps keep the science flowing. Thank you for all that you have done to keep us, well, bringing you live events when they happen, bringing you science when it happens, and helping provide you a place to learn and do science. So thank you and keep being awesome. And now I'm gonna answer your questions. So let's look and see what all we have. Hanny Zvorvarp asks, are there aurora on Mars or is the atmosphere too thin? It's not really the aurora that's the problem over on Mars, it's the lack of a magnetic field. You need to have a magnetic field that the high energy particles from the sun, the charged particles from the sun can flow along um, to drive them to create the kinds of auroras that we see. So we see amazing auroras on Saturn, on Jupiter, um, but that we know of, just not on Mars. Okay, so I'm going to now scroll up to the top and see what all 
we have, and I'm going to transition over to the chat screen. Um, here we go. So Larry Weird and Proud asks, did the meteor put the surface, uh, put get to the surface of the ocean or was it an airburst? It was an airburst. So the, the meteor that came in back in December over the Bering Sea did explode up in the clouds. Uh, <laughs> I understood what you meant, Larry. Uh, so Q23 asks, how many stars are estimated to be in such a cluster? Uh, in general, clusters have anywhere from hundreds to hundreds of thousands of stars. This particular one is smaller. I didn't see a number uh, listed and I don't know how faint they're sensitive to. One of the problems that you run into when you ask how many stars in a cluster is the majority of stars are actually really tiny little red dwarf stars and I don't know how faint they were able to see so I'm not sure they were sensitive to those faintest stars. And without surveying the faintest stars, I can only tell you how many bright stars were in the system. And the answer is a lot. I'm sorry that answer is vague. Sometimes science starts out as vague and we add details as we go. Science, after all, well, us scientists, we're not people who know everything. We're people who want to know everything and we're trying to get there. Give us time. We'll figure it out. So Henny Zorver asks, uh, to what would you attribute the ability of the cluster to stay together for all this time? Is that area of space pretty empty? So it's, I'm going to bring the images back up again. Um, it's in a galactic cluster. Sorry, it's in the galactic bulge. And that means that it's in a very dense area of space. Um, in this case, I'd say what's holding it together is the fact that it is so close to the center. The differences in uh, comfortable orbital velocities for the different stars in the cluster um, when it comes to their velocity around the center of the Milky Way isn't going to be as great for a cluster that's higher out, um, further out. A cluster that's further out, the stars that are inner are going to be trying to orbit faster than the stars that are outer. Um, Actually, I got that backwards. Scratch that. I have no clue why it's so tightly held together. I'm just going to go with that. I have no clue why it's still so tightly held together. These are things that mean I need to go find the newly published, didn't have time to read it before I report on, reported on it, news story. I have no idea. Um, we got lucky. Uh, let's see. Henny's former that's the one I just answered. Uh, Soleri asks, about what wavelengths are those images? And this is referring to uh, these images from the Chandra X-ray Observatory. These are images that were taken uh, across the kinds of wavelengths that get used to see your bones through your skin. This is X-ray light. Now, some of this is much stronger X-ray light, um, but it's X-ray wavelengths. Let's see what other questions we have in here. Uh, Hanny's Vorver, that's the one I asked about. Aurora, I already answered about Aurora on Mars. Um, and Hanny asks, could the solar system itself have an Aurora? So the, the way to think about that is what would cause it? So there is a, magne a heliosphere, uh, the magnetic field from our sun that reaches out all around our solar system. And if there were high energy charged particles in um, sufficient density to hit that magnetic field, but moving slowly enough that they didn't simply puncture it and fly through, then yes, in that very particular, you have charged particles, but they're moving slowly and they hit the, the magnetic field of the sun in high density. In theory, you could get that kind of an aurora, but I can't think of any events that would cause that high of a density of particles or low velocity of particles. So while it's theoretically possible, just like wormholes are theoretically possible, I think the nature of the universe means there isn't a way that it could actually happen. Um, white holes can't 
exist because they collapse as soon as something enters them. And since we have the cosmic microwave background, there's constantly stuff that would be entering them. So I think in this case, just the reality of our universe is going to nope that. Um, so yeah, that's all I have for this Friday. And I will say that there is weirdness going on down in Texas. Well, not weirdness. There is planned activity going on down in Texas surrounding the Starhopper uh, test vehicle that is being built by SpaceX. One of the local surf schools, and I love this particular news, one of the local surf schools down in the town where SpaceX is doing all of the construction has a camera pointed at the Starhopper. It's about six Six miles away they have one heck of a good zoom lens it looks like this is my interpretation of what I'm seeing um, and they're spying on what's going on at SpaceX and live streaming it to the internet so if we see that activity is picked up and it looks like something cool is gonna happen uh, we may surprisingly go live with that if activity picks up and we're not sure something's gonna happen I may start streaming but also subject you to the software that I'm writing basically play it by ear we're not sure what's going on but if it's cool we'll try and bring it to you live as it happens beyond that if you want more science today there will be a live recording we think and I'll explain them we think in a moment um, of astronomy cast at 3 p.m. Eastern noon Pacific that is 7 p.m. 8 p.m. Uh, London time. Now, the reason I put a caveat on it is, as you know, the Boeing uh, 737-800 MAX series airplanes are currently grounded. I think I got the right airplane code for that. Uh, and Fraser's on his way journeying back from a trip and he was scheduled to fly on a plane that is the model that is grounded and he's unsure if he'll get home on time. If he does, we will be doing a live recording of Astronomy Cast on YouTube. Uh, our topic for today is how do we know how old things are off our planet? So how do we know how old stars are? How old, well, clusters like the one that I was talking about earlier. Let me pull that up. Clusters like this. How do we know this is 12, more than 12 billion years old? Tune in and find out if Fraser is able to make it home. And that's all I have for today. Thank you all for being fabulous. This has been a production of CosmoQuest. We are a project of the Planetary Science Institute working in collaboration with Youngstown State University. We are here thanks to the generous contribu contributions of people like you. Thank you for everything that you do, all of your donations. Well, you keep the science flowing. I am now going to roll the credits, and when the credits are over, we are going to raid Obother. So give him a nice, happy rocket welcome, and learn about, well, all the amazing maker things he does. So thank you again, and uh, pardon me while I awkwardly find all the buttons I need to click in order to roll the credits. There are some things Streamlabs doesn't make as easy as you would like. So wherever you are in the world, have a fabulous morning, evening, afternoon. Um, if the weather is clear and you are far enough north, go outside, look up. There just might be an amazing light show from the sun. Have a fabulous morning, evening, or afternoon. Bye-bye.